Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for being here. Unfortunately, we saw heavy rains Monday night and expect more today, especially in the Northeast Kingdom. For instance, St. J area saw over eight inches, Island Pond seven inches, and Morgan received over six inches, all within a very short period of time. This heavy rainfall combined with saturated soil left nowhere for the water to go, leading to more flooding and more damage to infrastructure, property, and businesses. Especially concerning is the number of homes that have been destroyed, a list that unfortunately seems to be growing by the week, adding to a housing crisis we face for years. In December, when communities across the state were flooded, many for the second time in just a few months, I called it a gut punch. Two weeks ago, when communities uh, getting hit for the second or third time in a year, I called it a kick in the teeth. Now with many families and business owners, not to mention municipal leaders, um, municipal leaders, uh, and road crews, utility workers, and more, seeing all the progress they've made since the flooding three weeks ago being washed away again, it probably feels much worse than a punch or a kick. It's simply demoralizing, but we can't give up. We've got to stick together and fight back against the feeling of defeat. If there was ever a time when we needed our tight-knit communities to show up, it's now. If you haven't been impacted by this flooding, I encourage you to find a way to help. No deed is too small. Remember the Ackerman sisters from Hardwick who set up a lemonade stand to help the House of Pizza open back up. That was a year ago. By the way, unfortunately, the House of Pizza was one of the businesses hit again three weeks ago. So check on your neighbors near and far, find a local organization that's coordinating cleanup, or register to volunteer at vermont.gov slash volunteer. And if time is in short supply, but you have resources, make a donation to a local charitable organization, or the Red Cross, or the Vermont Community Foundation. And if you need help mucking out and cleaning up, please contact the Crisis Cleanup Hotline at 802-242-2054, and they'll connect you with volunteers. Turning back to the July 11th storm, FEMA was here inspecting damage last week to determine if we meet the threshold for public assistance or individual assistance. They concluded those inspections and based on the data collected, we believe there's a strong case for a major disaster declaration. The next step is to send a formal request to the president that will include both individual and public assistance, and we expect to send that within the next couple of days. Again, this declaration request is for the July 11th storm and does not include this week's rain event. If you were impacted by flooding this week, it's important to contact 211 to report your damage so we have an accurate picture of the impacts. I want to be clear, we don't know if we'll qualify for assistance from the most recent storm, but we won't know for sure until we have more data. So again, please contact 211 either online or phone to report any flood-related damage you might have. Finally, I want to again extend my appreciation to all Vermonters who are helping with response and recovery from first responders to local road crews to volunteers stepping up to help their communities and neighbors. I know this may seem never-ending, but we'll get through it, continue to build back, increase our resiliency, and put ourselves in a better position to withstand future storms. With that, I'll now turn it over to Commissioner Morrison. Thank you, Governor. Good afternoon. 
the flash flooding and subsequent river flooding on July 30th was not an event that was predicted. It appears that a small storm cell stalled out over the Northeast Kingdom and dropped four to eight inches of rain in areas such as Linden, Danville, St. Johnsbury, Morgan, and Island Pond. We moved quickly in the early morning hours to activate Swiftwater rescue teams to respond to the most heavily impacted areas. Remarkably, we were able to mobilize 10 Swiftwater teams. Those teams included three state urban search and rescue teams, as well as teams from Colchester, Stowe, Hartford, Littleton, New Hampshire, Linden, and two teams from Rescue Inc. in Brattleboro. In a matter of hours, 50 personnel responded and made 12 rescues and 15 evacuations. I want to take a moment to thank and to spotlight these teams, all volunteers, who answered the call in the middle of the night and responded without hesitation to what turned out to be raging floodwaters and dangerous conditions. The teams wrapped up rescue operations by 2 p.m. yesterday and spent the rest of the day searching damaged and destroyed buildings. The teams continued to perform evacuations in the hardest hit areas of Lindenville until 9 p.m. Many of those areas are still inaccessible today. Because inclement weather is predict predicted for today, we are in the process of staging swift water rescue assets in central and northeastern parts of the state. Additional teams are also available if conditions in other parts of Vermont need their services. We will discuss the weather in just a moment. I want to follow up on what the governor spoke of, and that is how to report new damage sustained on July 30th, 2024. Call 211 or report online to 211 and notify your insurance company. The 211 flood reporting page has been updated to allow users to select which event they are reporting for. You can report, you can still report damage from the July 9th, 10th, 11th, whichever day the damage happened to you event, or from the July 29th to 30th event. If you sustained damage three weeks ago and now have sustained additional damage, please complete a report for both dates. We have already received 105 residential damage reports and six reports of damage to businesses from this week's storm. We have to do the same process of information gathering and preliminary assessments to both public and private infrastructure to determine if any counties will qualify for assistance from FEMA for the events of July 30th. This generally takes several weeks to complete. We have very preliminary information indicating that 50 or more homes were destroyed or took on major damage in this event. Again, it is far too soon to give you reliable totals because many of the hardest hit areas are still inaccessible. Here's what's important right now. Debris and life safety. Homeowners and towns must prioritize the removal of debris. Woody debris, construction material, piled up rocks and sediment from culverts, stormwater systems, under bridges, and anywhere that will cause more damage if we get similar rains. The debris has got to get moved to let water flow and minimize damage from whatever comes next. If towns have identified areas of obstructive debris, please work through your emergency management director to notify the Emergency Operations Center. Let's talk about what might be next. The weather today. We expect to see widespread, slow-moving thunderstorms with high rainfall rates. This could produce isolated instances of flash flooding, particularly in areas that are already oversaturated. 
We also anticipate nuisance flooding in urban, low-lying, and poor drainage areas, especially if multiple storms track over the same area. The most likely time frame for these storms is from noon, right now, until 9 p.m. We expect to see sharp rises on rivers and streams, especially in areas that have seen recent rainfall and in areas of steep terrain. A flood watch is in effect for all of Vermont except Bennington and Wyndham counties until midnight tonight. Because the ground is so wet in some areas, there is an increased likelihood of landslides. We want everyone to pay attention to the weather this afternoon and take precautions as necessary. Looking ahead, very high heat is predicted for Thursday through Saturday. Heat indices of 95 or more are possible. Again, please stay in tune with the weather for the next few days and take precautions as appropriate. Now let's take a look back to the July 10th flooding. The status of our uh, declaration for public and individual assistance, the governor already covered. Uh, in addition, we have received to date uh, 2,425 reports to 211 of residential damage and 270 reports to, of damage to businesses. As the governor mentioned, we anticipate having the complete declaration request fully submitted to FEMA Region 1 by the end of the week. As soon as we hear anything about either public assistance or individual assistance, we will share that out. In the meantime, don't wait for our FEMA to make repairs or to clean up. Just be sure to save receipts and document your repairs with photos and video. Lastly, a couple of thank yous. I'd like to thank all who have stepped up and volunteered to help neighbors in need. No matter how small or large your efforts have been, they matter. Whether it's help mucking out a basement or making a meal for someone or driving across the state to rescue people from cars swept up in floodwaters, thank you. I'd also like to thank all of the helping organizations who have continued to support Vermont in flood recovery. There are too many to mention here, but please know that your hard work, along with your care and compassion, are greatly appreciated. And I'd like to thank all of the folks working in the State Emergency Operations Center structure. This includes hundreds of state employees, countless first responders, as well as local partners, nonprofit organizations, and many, many more. Your long hours and selfless dedication are seen and appreciated. I wish I could thank every one of you personally. And a hearty thank you to our partners in the media for sharing critical updates with the public, for asking questions on their behalf, and most importantly, for getting out into the hardest hit communities to chronicle their experiences and document the damage. We are all in this together, and supporting Vermonters is a goal we share. Lastly, I'd like to thank Lowe's for their generous donation of hundreds of muck-out kits. These kits have been tremendously helpful to those in need. With that, I'll turn things over to Secretary Flynn from the Agency of Transportation. He will be joining us remotely. Good afternoon, and thank you, Commissioner Morrison. I'll be talking about state roads and bridges that are closed at this point in time. From the earlier floods three weeks ago, Route 5 in Barnett remains closed. We have reopened Route 102 in Maidstone, Vermont. From the storms of the 30th, we currently have six Vermont state roads closed. Excuse me. They are Route 2 in East St. Johnsbury. Route 5 in St. Johnsbury, Route 105 in Brighton from Lakeshore Drive to Ethan Allen Drive, Route 111 in Morgan, and Route 111 at the intersection of Route 114. So basically Route 111 from 114 west to the public beach in Morgan 
is closed, as is also Route 114 in Eastburg due to a bridge which is severely compromised. From three weeks ago, one bridge is still damaged, and that is the one at Route 5 in Barnett. From this event this week, we have three bridges that are still compromised, Route 111 in Brighton, Route 114 in Eastburg, and Route 5 in St. Johnsbury. Railroad closures, the Connecticut River Line, which only reopened last week from the earlier July storm, is now closed again from the St. Johnsbury Rail Yard north. AOT is also aware of damage on the privately owned Genesee and Wyoming rail line that enters Vermont and Norton and goes to Island Pond and east to Bloomfield into New Hampshire. There are reports of extensive damage from Island Pond east to Bloomfield. The Lamoille Valley Rail Trail from Barrel, the prior storm in the first part of July, two closures remain. Mile post 13.37 to 14.2. That's Danville Village to West Danville Park and Ride. And mile post 34.3 to 40.6 from the Hardwick Trailhead to the Wolcott Trailhead. From the event of this week, there is an additional closure on the Lamoille Valley Rail Trail, and that is between St. Johnsbury and Marty's store in Danville. There are multiple damaged sites in that section. Public transit, the Jalen route, which runs St. Johnsbury to Linden, Bill and back is not running due to the flooding and the shelter in place instructions. All other services in Vermont are running and navigating road closures as necessary. There are no impacts to aviation in Vermont. That concludes the report on the Vermont state owned assets. And now I would turn it over to Secretary Moore. Thank you, Secretary Flynn. Good afternoon, everyone. Today I'll start by sharing a summary of our agency's actions in response to the floods of July 11th as well as work regarding yesterday's floods. And then I'll provide some helpful information for local officials who are working to meet the requirements of the National Flood Insurance Program. Yesterday's flooding in the Northeast Kingdom appears to have impacted two public drinking water systems. In St. Johnsbury, a lightning strike at the water treatment plant destroyed a controller that managed part of the water system operation. And we are currently working with the town to understand the long-term impacts of having it offline. The water main that broke during the July 10th and 11th flood was exposed again, but the line is intact. Currently, we do not believe there are service outages, meaning all users have water and there are no boil water advisories for St. Johnsbury. However, town officials are asking users to exercise conservation and reduce water demands to the extent possible. In Lindenville, several of the wells that served the system were again inundated by floodwaters as they were on July 10th and so are not currently being used. The system will be cleaning, disinfecting, and flushing prior to collecting samples to return those wells to service. However, there is sufficient water from the unaffected well to serve residents in the interim. There is one boil water notice that remains in place from the July 10th storms, and that's for the Barnett School, and we expect that to be resolved by the end of next week. Similarly, two wastewater facilities were impacted by the flooding this week. A pump station and sewer main were damaged in St. Johnsbury, and the town has contractors on site working to implement temporary repairs. 
In addition, the access road to the Bart or Brighton wastewater facility was washed out, but reports we've received indicate it did not impact the treatment plant or sewer main. Brighton State Park is closed due to the flash flooding. There was flooding in and around the park and in interior park roads have washed out in places. All state parks that were affected by the July 10th flood have reopened, although three parks, Ricker Pond, Sayon Lodge, and Stillwater still have reduced operations. The geology team has received three new reports of erosive and landslide act events this week related to erosion of private roads and driveways in Bolton, Worcester, and Barnet. The team is also aware of several landslides associated with yesterday's storm in St. Johnsbury and plans to be on the ground there today. The dam safety program has been reaching out to dam owners in the Northeast Kingdom and has not identified any critical concerns. We also hosted the Army Corps of Engineers on Monday and Tuesday this week who toured several dam sites, including the flood control facilities in Eastbury, Wrightsville, and Waterbury. Since July 10th, the River Management Program has received 122 requests for technical assistance and has issued 25 emergency protective and next flood measure authorizations, with many more anticipated in the coming weeks and months. And we continue to urge Vermonters to contact us for assistance. If you visit the Agency of Natural Resources website, anr.vermont.gov slash flood, there are links to all of these programs. Shifting gears to talk about the National Flood Insurance Program, also sometimes referred to as NFIP. As we await final word on the final disaster or federal disaster declarations for our hardest hit counties, there are other important ways that recovery in Vermont intersects with FEMA. And one of those is by being part of FEMA's National Flood Insurance Program. There are steps that both communities and individuals that have been flooded should take. After a flood, Property owners and renters who have been flooded, as Commissioner Morrison said, should do the necessary cleanup, drying out, and making temporary repairs needed for safety. You're also encouraged to talk with your town zoning administrator and ask for guidance on repairs for things that may need to be done in a certain way to maintain your eligibility for future flood insurance. Things like if you need to replace your utilities, elevating them using and using flood resistant materials that may not be damaged by future weather events. And as Commissioner Morrison said, it is important to take photos and keep receipts for labor and materials purchased. For communities that have had flooding, please be aware of your role in recovery under the National Flood Insurance Program. The NFIP is a voluntary program but 92% of Vermont communities are part of the NFIP. When a community joins the NFIP, it makes federally backed flood insurance available for all residents, whether they are a renter or a property owner. When joining the NFIP, a community agrees to, at a minimum, regulate land development in the FEMA mapped floodplain sometimes referred to as the Special Flood Hazard Area. NFIP regulations are intended to reduce damage from flooding to new structures as they are built or existing structures as they are improved. After a flood, communities that participate in the NFIP need to assess flood damage on those properties within the Special Flood Hazard Area before repairs should begin. And although we know that in the immediate aftermath of a flood, it is in an incredibly challenging time for many, these assessments help ensure that any repairs are more flood resilient and meet current NFIP standards, which in turn reduces the risk of future damage, loss of life and property, 
and ensures that federally backed flood insurance will remain available to residents. After a flood, communities participating in the NFIP will need to track and permit repairs for buildings in those special flood hazard areas. But it's important to understand that FEMA NFIP tracking is different than FEMA public assistance tracking. For communities that need help with the National Flood Insurance Program, there are floodplain managers at the Agency of Natural Resources who are available to help um, with post-flood permitting and substantial damage assessments. And for additional information, you can either call 802-490-6157 or go to anr.vermont.com dot gov slash flood and click on the river damage and restoration tab and with that I'll turn it back over to the governor thank you secretary Moore we'll now open it up to questions governor can you talk about the dynamic of the timing here I mean people were asleep when the worst of this came through like can you just talk about what that dynamic is like in terms of differentiating from other floods well, again, uh, this one was a surprise to us in some respects. Uh, we monitor the weather. I think everyone does these days. And uh, we knew that there were going to be storms, but, um, but didn't expect this one to this magnitude, this much volume uh, would hover over the St. Johnsbury area. Um, so it was, uh, it was a situation where I, I think uh, I can ask Commissioner Morrison to, to speak more about this, but the Swift Water Rescue Team was uh, was called in at quarter of two. Um, Mike Cannon received the call first and, and assembled the team, which was amazing, um, volunteers to come to the aid of those in that community in such a short period of time. So everyone rallied and, uh, and went to where the situation was unfolding, and, uh, and I think uh, were able to to satisfy or save save lives in the uh, in the response. So it's uh, just one of those things where they train for that. Uh, they're very good at that, and uh, and they they responded. How do we Can I jump in there? A little sure. Bit? Thanks. So. Um, the National Weather Service is always in touch with our watch officer at VEM if there's any abnormal uh, weather situation. And the reality of life in Vermont is that most of those folks have the direct phone numbers of folks like Eric, myself, Mike Cannon. Uh, so I want to start by saying that there's always somebody watching the weather, right? Um, all responses start at the local level, and it's because we have such dedicated volunteers and career people in these communities that are willing to go the minute they hear a word that the water's rising or there's power lines in the water or whatever it is. Somebody needs help. The local first responders go, and again, they very quickly feed information back to the SEOC, and we can then rally the teams, as the governor said. Um, these are teams who are highly trained and, and have a variety of technical skills, but they're always ready. Their gear is always packed, their go bags are always packed, their rigs are ready to roll and fueled, and it's really just a matter of getting the call and saying, this is where you need to go. It is not any different than our state police special teams that are always ready to roll if a situation goes down. So um, it is a combination of local first responders getting eyes on an event and quickly escalating the, the call for resources that outstrip what they have at the local level and then having these dedicated volunteers who are prepared and well trained and getting them out the door quickly so um, i would say that considering the onset was in the middle of the night and the initial hours of the operations took place in, in darkness uh, that we had pretty remarkable outcomes and uh, then the teams continued to work all day uh, clearing houses that were um, damaged or destroyed trying to make sure there was nobody stuck there that couldn't be accounted for and uh, they'll be ready today for whatever the weather serves up so. yeah you, the last question for the governor too I mean the you know last year's floods we knew that they were coming for days we were able to build up resources with this one I mean how do we reassure Vermonters 
that, that we're prepared or that we can fight an enemy, you know, that essentially like, we can't see them sometimes, you know, it came in out of nowhere. I mean, how do you reassure Vermonters? I think our response in the last two years speaks for itself, whether it was known or an unknown event. We have saved lives and um, not had any a big oopses where we couldn't cover an area. When we say we mobilized uh, 10 Swiftwater teams, we have, uh, one of those was out of state, by the way, so nine in-state teams. We have 13 in-state 13 in-state teams that we can pick up the phone and call and, and send them where the need is. But obviously Littleton, New Hampshire was bordering that area and they jumped in the fray. We have similar arrangements all along our borders. Um, so I, I am very confident that we can meet most of what Mother Nature doles out. However, um, I would never challenge her because th there are always going to be worse and bigger events that we can't foresee. Uh, but that's why these teams and their deployment are scalable uh, and we keep them in a state of high readiness. Just to put an exclamation point on you know, the local folks and local teams, local first responders, they are the ones who are immediately there and uh, then they call for assistance um, from that point on. But when you think about, um, and, and I'm, we're probably not unique uh, to other states, but I like to think we are at times, um, because we're always ready for an emergency in some respects. You think about uh, the local town crews uh, that have to plow on a moment's notice when all of a sudden it, we get eight, 12 inches of snow that wasn't expected, and that happens, or a rainstorm that wasn't expected and uh, ice uh, when utility crews have to come out at a moment's notice. They do that day in and day out. This is part of their lives, and, uh, and I think it makes uh, Vermont even more special um, because, again, as Commissioner Morrison has said, um, I don't believe we've had any failures in that respect. They're always ready to go. If we have more opportunity, when we can see barrel um, coming up the coast, uh, then that would uh, that would help us, uh, but in this case we, we didn't know it was coming, and uh, but we reacted uh, in the same fashion. What I guess would be your message to say municipality leaders, because whether it was a few weeks ago or again now, they're talking about these damages that are double, triple, quadruple just their yearly budget. And I know there's the money that came out of the e-board yesterday, but besides taking out loans, they just have no idea how they're going to be able to keep fixing up their municipalities again. Yeah, well again, uh, that's where FEMA comes in, that's where we come in, uh, that's where the municipal bond bank comes in, and uh, we're there to help in any way we, we uh, have the opportunity to, um, but we have to know about it as well. Um, so I might ask uh, Doug Farnham, Farnham, our uh, chief recovery officer, uh, to expand on that further, but, um, but we know uh, that uh, towns and municipalities are tapped out and uh, that's why we went to the emergency board to ask for more money uh, to assist and uh, and we'll continue to do so governor so the five million from the e-board is a bridge measure to help us get through the short term we do see with especially the sequential events um, if you take july last december june and now another event we have some communities um, that could potentially have faced four separate events so both from a human resources and a financial perspective, they're extremely strained. I think it will be incredibly important as we go into the legislative session that it's a serious part of the discussion, how we adapt in the long run to supporting our communities. Right now, we are reliant on FEMA. We, of course, only have a limited amount of money in Vermont, and we need to spend it uh, in a responsible and prudent manner. And adaptation, I think, is is got to be near the top of that list. But I think as a, as a helpful note, um, we did invest in agreement with the legislature over $41 million to act to put towards hazard mitigation that's going to unlock another, you know, over $80 million of federal funds. So we, over the course of the next couple of years, will be spending as a state over $100 million on hazard mitigation, reducing the risk to these towns. And that's where we're taking a statewide approach. We already have proposed projects of over $100 million, and we're confident that we will be able to, to move those forward working with FEMA. So I think reducing the risk in the long run is incredibly important, 
bridging the short-term capital, and I'm also working with the bond bank and the treasurer's office. Um, you know, the measures the treasurer took last year, uh, some of those funds, uh, if the FEMA has uh, reimbursed a town, we're able to start to try to turn those around, increase lending, and uh, the treasurer and the bond bank are evaluating whether or not they can perform another round of that lending. So that'll be more of the medium term uh, support for, for municipalities to have resources. But I do think adaptation in the long run, that, that needs to be on our radar. We of course have to survive the short term and, and get through the immediate response and, and public safety aspect of it. But, um, and then we can talk in the session about adaptation. Big picture, Governor, how worried are you about today's rain? I think, think I get more apprehensive every storm. Um, I think all of us uh, are watching the weather because of what happened on, on Monday. Again, we didn't see that one coming and, and unfolded uh, much differently than we, we thought. Um, so with already saturated soils um, and, uh, and already damaged infrastructure, uh, this just adds insult to injury, and an inch or two uh, of rain uh, in a short period of time uh, could be catastrophic uh, for some. So, yeah, we're watching, watching everything happening, especially in those impacted areas from uh, from Monday. It feels kind of trite to ask, but did you ever think it could get this bad this fast? No, no, I, I, I in some respects, no. I mean, I. I think like a lot of us, um, when we had Irene, we thought that that was going to be the 100-year storm. Um, and then um, 10 years later, we had another equally uh, impactful, devastating storm uh, that um, did a lot of damage. And then to think one year later, we had another storm. So we uh, were seeing more frequency, uh, which is concerning. Uh, but it leads to we need to mitigate further. We need to create more areas of uh, to store water. Uh, we need to uh, to harden uh, some of the infrastructure to be sure that we protect uh, people in the future. Um, going back to municipal finances, um, I know you had expressed a worry that you know we might be triggering the 75 percent threshold instead of the 10 threshold. Um, how concerned are you about you know successive storms that don't hit the max FEMA threshold, kind of wrecking both finance, you know, municipal finances, but also the state's ability to, to financially respond? Yeah, I think again, uh, some of my concern is uh, border counties uh, that have received damage. We saw that uh, a year ago. Uh, Addison didn't qualify, for instance. Uh, and uh, but they were just right across uh, the border, so to speak. But their their uh, damages were significant, and uh, and FEMA wasn't there to help because of a process, a rule of some sort. I'd like to see more latitude with FEMA in those situations, because why does it matter which zip code you're in or what county you live in? If you receive damage, you should get some help. And uh, and I look uh, at whether it's individual assistance or public assistance in the same way. Why is the magnitude uh, different? Because someone living on, uh, on uh, Red Village Road in, uh, in Lindenville uh, received a lot of devastation. There was probably maybe four bridges on that, uh, on that route, many homes uh, that, uh, that are damaged beyond repair. Um, and if we don't if, they, if we don't reach the threshold the the, the, the equation uh, to uh, to get to individual assistance what do they do and what does the town do if we don't get I believe we will but if we didn't get to um, a public assistance threshold so I think we on the national level and I know was, uh, Senator Welch has talked about this maybe a revamping of FEMA taking a look and it's not FEMA's fault. Um, FEMA is just a creature of the Congress. Um, they do what they're told. They're funded by Congress, and the rules uh, around uh, FEMA are, are dictated as well. And, and so the Congress has, has the means to change the way we look at things, and I think we're going to have to.
Governor, what's the status of the Army Corps of Engineers study on the uh, sort of the baseline study of Vermont's flight capacity? I know the, um, I'll ask uh, Secretary Moore to, to comment further, but when they came, they were here just yesterday, day before, and uh, looked at some of our reservoirs uh, to, uh, to, you know, assess the capacity and, and whether we could do more or whether they're adequate or not. So um, they've been in town, and I'm expecting them to continue to be a partner. So we did have the opportunity yesterday to tour those three flood control facilities in central Vermont um, with a, a number of representatives from the Army Corps. I think it's important to reflect that building new large-scale flood control dams would be a difficult proposition in Vermont. Um, so really what this, the focus of this conversation was about um, are there options to increase flood protection um, using those existing facilities? So both can we have a, a higher degree or any degree of operational control at Wrightsville and East Barrie? As you may remember, both of those facilities are considered passive flood control facilities, so they have a certain amount of storage that they are capable of holding back. And then anything that exceeds that capacity, which fortunately has not happened since they were constructed, um, would, would head downstream. Um, but we're looking at, at those opportunities. We also have a multi-million dollar refurbishment project that is just getting underway, <clears throat> excuse me, at the Waterbury facility, which is our largest state-owned flood protection dam. Uh, we believe that work will stretch out into 2027 or 2028, but it is underway at this point with some initial um, activities in partnership with the Corps. Um, the Vermont Natural Resource Council has a small local dam removal program that says we will reduce local flooding. Um, I'm wondering if your administration is concerned that local dam removal, um, which if they stay, might sort of spread out the water locally, like what you sort of been hoping would happen. Um, is there a concern that taking out these small dams would actually send more water rushing downstream? No, the, the dams that the Vermont Natural Resources Council and other local watershed partners have been working to remove um, were, were never providing flood protection. Um, and if left in place, frankly, um, oftentimes due to the, the state of disrepair many of those dams are in, actually present a, a flood hazard of their own um, in that poorly maintained dams can fail um, catastrophically uh, during a, a flood event and create a hazardous situation. Um, and so it, it's been an, an intentional working group that's identified dams that are, are really don't have those other um, public purposes or public benefits, um, including things like recreation and hydropower generation in addition to flood protection. Um, the, the dams that are being proposed for removal or have been removed at this point do not serve any public benefit, um, and we feel like the, the most resilient strategy is to, to take them out. Thank you. I have a question about dam or uh, um, debris removal. Um, you mentioned that's a, a really big issue. I was in Moortown earlier this week, and they had some concerns about debris that's on private property in people's yards that either hasn't been cleaned up either from last year, or this year, or, or whenever. And that's, of course, a big concern for culverts and whatnot. So what, to what degree does the state or local municipalities have latitude or authority to compel people or require people to, to clean up their yards? Um. It's a major initiative uh, to clean up all of the debris uh, along our rivers and and uh, and waterways. So we're uh, we're contemplating what we can do at this point in time. Um, I broached the subject with the with the emergency board uh, yesterday that may be looking for funding in order to take care of some of that. And the more I travel the state and look at the damage, the more concerned I am about the debris that I'm seeing, the woody debris in particular, uh, some of the gravel deposits uh, near the uh, inlets of the, the culverts and, and uh, under the bridges and so forth needs to be cleaned out uh, sooner rather than later. 
uh, so that it doesn't impact, so we don't have a flash flood, so we don't cause another problem that could have been prevented had we cleaned that out. But it's hard to catch up, and, uh, and we need to uh, to take another look at how we do that. And I think we're going to ask for some funding, and it, we'll develop a plan that we're working on now. I don't have any details for you, but uh, I think it's going to be a major initiative in order to to at least get the inlets and, and areas that we can see um, cleaned up. I think the Secretary more a few weeks ago said there was like 700-ish something miles of, of rivers and 7,000. Oh, 7,000. Yeah. Excuse me. I believe. Um, what, what would it take? I mean, from, from a workforce perspective, a money perspective, a yeah. time perspective? We're working out those details right now. Again, we can't do everything, uh, but, but there are some areas, uh, again, that were damaged you take uh, Plainfield, uh, go up the Brook Road. You can see a lot of a lot of tree damage, a lot of damage, uh, down trees uh, that are just waiting uh, to be swept away by uh, another flood. Um, I was in, uh, up in Lindenville yesterday, and there's a lot of debris in some of the inlets around some of the, the bridge structures and box culverts and so forth, and and that's replicated throughout the state. Um, so. We start, uh, you know, prioritizing, uh, looking for those areas that uh, that we can get to quicker. It'll take some some specific uh, equipment, I believe, to do that. Maybe, you know, in some cases, a long-reach excavator with a thumb on it to pick uh, that debris out. Some could be a, a feller buncher from a logger uh, could do. Uh, some winching uh, some out uh, with uh, skitters and so forth. I think it's going to be number of different strategies in order to accomplish this. Can I just get a quick a couple of details on the um, swift water rescues, like how many were conducted? Over the period of about 2 a.m. till uh, about 9 a.m., they did 12 uh, rescues. So that's a, a live rescue off either a car or out of a house. And then they did 15 evacuations. Thank you. But that was just from that was just the, night, right? just the night it was happening. Oh, no, no, the 30th. The night Sorry, of the 30th. 30th. Sorry. Right, I was at this week. Right. Thank you. All right, we'll go to the phones. Juan, BT Digger. Secretary Moore, maybe you, Governor, um, North Country Union Supervisor Union, North Country that is, um, recently installed PCB mitigation uh, technology, airflow sensors, that type of thing to improve the PCB quality of the situation there, but the conditions are actually getting worse. What, what can districts, and I know they're not the first, but what can districts do about this? Well, we're working with North Country at this point in time. There are 80 contractors in there now uh, trying to do remediation work, uh, trying to get to uh, two weeks from now, three weeks from now, uh, so that they can open back up for, for school. So there are uh, remediation strategies. I don't know if they're going to work, uh, but, uh, but they're working feverishly uh, to get that accomplished, and then they'll be tested uh, after that. But uh, Secretary Moore has been involved, as has uh, um, Secretary Saunders and, uh, and others, and Dr. Levine. Um, the, the governor's description of, is accurate. We are removing, in the process of removing what have been identified as the most problematic building materials. Uh, it is oftentimes caulk that's used to seal around windows, also used to seal around air intake structures coming into the building, and then window glazing. Um, and we are, are working um, sequentially through what are referred to as the B and C wings of North Country Union High School. Uh, work is be, has been completed in a portion of the C wing and that's where testing will be conducted. Um, in the, the coming days we expect to have results um, in the, the second maybe week of August um, and hope they will give an indication of the, the success of those efforts. We had done previous steps as you alluded to um, this winter with 
paints and uh, special tapes that can encapsulate PCB containing materials. Um, but they, they proved not to, to reduce the concentrations of PCBs to a level in indoor air uh, that we felt was, was uh, environmentally health protective. The PCB pause bill didn't make it over the finish line this year. Is the administration still of the mind that we should be continuing on with the testing, with funding, that type of thing? Our focus right now is on the approximately uh, 19 schools that we identified in the with the initial testing where we found exceedances of our immediate action level. Um, and in particular, seven of those 19 schools had classroom spaces that showed these high levels of PCBs. Um, continue the dialogue with the legislature about how to complete the testing. To date, we've tested just about half of Vermont schools. Um, but in the in the near term, are really focused on remediating the condition, the problematic conditions we identified. Just as a reminder, that was a legislative initiative to begin with, and um, but once we start, uh, we we follow the law. We want to make sure that we're keeping people safe, and once we encounter PCBs, we think we have an obligation to mediate that. I wonder if you or Secretary Mark could expand on your statement that building a new flood control dam in Vermont is an unlikely proposition. Um, I'll let Secretary Moore. It's, it's a very expensive, obviously, uh, process. Where would you put it? Uh, there are other steps that could be taken for less money, I believe. Uh, but uh, Secretary Moore. I, I think the, the governor is exactly right. It would be a very expensive proposition and a very disruptive proposition. Um, as you may be aware, there were uh, small communities or individual farms that were flooded out by the construction of those three central Vermont flood control facilities. Um, and it was challenging in the 1930s um, to pursue that kind of strategy, and I think it would be even more challenging in, in modern times given the additional development that's taken place in Vermont. So what are those intermediate steps then? What are we looking at here? The intermediate steps around improving. I mean, if we don't have a new dam, what are some things we can do to control flooding? Well, sure. sure. So that uh, part of it would be the increased level of operational control over the flood control facilities we do have, trying to store more water in those systems. Um, as the governor has spoken to, I think another really important component of that is floodplain uh, reconnection and restoration, looking for places where there isn't existing development or where there are flood impacted properties that are pursuing FEMA buyouts and taking those opportunities to create additional storage uh, within the watershed, allowing the rivers to spread out in places where they won't do as much damage um, and hopefully protect our, our um, downtowns and designated centers as a result. Thank you all very much.